Treatment options for nets vary widely depending on where they originate and whether they are localized or metastatic. When I talk to patients about treatments, I would say that that's really a very optimistic, hopeful area because we use we have lots of tools in our toolbox. PRT is the shiny new toy um, for neuroendocrine tumors, so it stands for peptide receptor radionuclide therapy. We've been eager to get this available in the United States for years, um, just. By way of history, this has been available in Europe for about a decade. Um, it's been studied in smaller trials, but never prospectively studied in a big randomized phase three clinical trial until the trial called Netter one And the results of that trial demonstrated that PRRT did a better job of delaying progression than octreotide did. So on average, Patients lived for about two and a half years without progression, and about one in five patients, or 20% of patients, had some degree of tumor shrinkage. Historically, PRT took a very long time to develop all the way from the 1970s onwards, so finally that it was approved was uh, a real, real positive thing for our field to show that this is something that you know is accepted by the general medical community and can be uh, available now. So the role of PRT in neuroendocrine tumor patients in the United States anyway is evolving. Um, it's newly approved, it was approved in 2018. It's been associated with a delay in progression in GI neuroendocrine tumors, but based on some data from Europe, it's also been approved for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. PRT basically filled an important gap of being able not only to stabilize, but actually shrink and and reduce symptoms in patients with progressive neuroendocrine tumors. It's basically a radioactive isotope. Uh, in the case of Lutathera, it's lutetium-177, which is a beta-emitting isotope attached to a somatostatin analog, octreotate, and that delivers radiation to somatostatin receptor expressing neuroendocrine tumor cells, generally well-differentiated nets. It's designed for patients with metastatic, well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors uh, tumors that are not surgically resectable, and generally in patients who have already progressed on a somatostatin analog like octreotide or lanreotide. Because it's a form of radiation that's given intravenously and does have some potential side effects, it's not typically used up front when somebody's newly diagnosed. So usually patients will be started on um, a somatostatin analog, as an example, before they would actually be treated with peptide receptor radionuclide therapy. So the only thing we can say right now with a degree of confidence is that uh, PRT should probably be administered as a, at least a second line treatment after progression on a somatostatin analog, either octreotide or lanreotide. It gets a little bit trickier deciding whether it should be the second line treatment, the third line, the fourth line, and that depends on, on what the competing treatment options are, uh, which is based to some extent on where the cancer originated uh, and where it spread. Uh, is it just spread to the liver? Is it spread to other organs? Are the tumors strongly expressive of some metastatin receptors or not so strongly? So there's a lot of different variables that go into whether it probably should be considered second-line treatment or not. Radiation has risks, as does chemotherapy, as do the so-called targeted agents, which are you know not, don't fall under the chemotherapy or radiation category, but certainly have a lot of risks. I would say any drug has, has risks and benefits regardless of what what label it falls under, and so you really have to consider that rather than the, the name of the drug. You know, I think one important question for patients to ask is, how do the nuclear medicine doctors and medical oncologists work together? I think different centers are really still trying to figure this out. I think that best practice is really a multidisciplinary clinic and care where both the nuclear medicine doctors and medical oncologists work in close collaboration. It's a very logistically challenging treatment. So there's lots of care coordination that needs to get done. And I think we are all, as a community, still trying to figure out best practices for that, but I think it's valuable for patients to ask. You know, the development of PRT took a very long time, many decades for it to be approved. And one might think that, that during that time, things were, all worked out in terms of all the details of how to give PRT and when to give PRT, but it's, um, it turns out that actually all of those many other detailed questions still need to be resolved. So many of those things um, have 
are currently being tried in, in different clinical trials. We do go through a very rigorous process to ensure that this is the appropriate treatment for that particular patient at that particular time. So uh, the first thing that I would say is that everything is done in the context of a multidisciplinary tumor board, so we're not individually making these choices, but there are uh, specialists across the board there, including surgeons, oncologists, endocrinologists, radiologists, nuclear medicine, pathologists. We all discuss the case together and then we determine you know, what are the different types of treatment options that are available and what would be best for that patient. I think we're still learning how to use it. So when in a patient's treatment should it be introduced? I tell most patients that it shouldn't be the first treatment and it shouldn't be the last treatment. So it's somewhere in between and that's really dependent on the patient, their other medical conditions, and the goals of treatment. So the administration of PRRT is relatively straightforward. Uh, ultimately, once you kind of know about it a little bit, it's administered as four cycles of the treatment once every two months. That can be adjusted a little bit depending on how the patient is doing and if there's any abnormalities with the lab, lab work and so forth. Patients come in, they get uh, they started on amino acid infusion, usually arginine lysine. After a certain amount has been given, they receive the actual radioactive drug, Ludothera. And so the entire process takes about four, five, six hours, um, and it's repeated every eight weeks for four treatments. After each cycle of the PRRT, patients generally feel uh, quite well. Uh, some patients might, again, have a little bit of nausea related to the amino acids. Other patients might feel a little bit of tiredness for the first few days. So about 20% of patients will have very significant tumor shrinkage, meaning basically in, you know, tumor shrinking by about half. Um, and sometimes that's, that's quite sustained as far as progression-free survival. Whether patients need to experience tumor shrinkage to have benefit is, is debatable. Uh, as far as time to progression, it doesn't seem to make much difference whether they have stable disease or, or tumor shrinkage. But obviously, you know, we're, we're happier when we see tumors actually shrink quality of life uh, and reduction of some of the symptoms associated with uh, neuroendocrine tumor, those can happen relatively soon, sometimes even after the first cycle, but definitely after several cycles, you should begin to see some benefit if there will be one. Um, but in terms of progression-free survival, those can take sometimes years to see, which is a good thing. I think the role of PRT is gonna to continue to evolve. Um, I think it's here to stay and I think it represents a really important advance in the field. Um, hopefully, we're going to become wiser in terms of understanding um, which patients are most likely to benefit from PRT. Um, we know that the whole story is not simply being DOTA positive, that you know some patients do have shrinkage, others don't, and I think we don't fully understand what determines which patients have stability versus which patients actually have major shrinkage versus which patients have tumors that grow right through it. So there'll be more work done to better understand the predictors of outcome. Again, all of this I think will happen as we understand more about how the PRT works. I'm hoping that uh, we move forward um, with developing new PRT agents uh, with uh, even better therapeutic index. In other words, higher level of activity, lower level of toxicity. Um, I think we're sort of at the infancy of alpha emitting PRT. It's a completely different type of radiation. It, it delivers a much higher energy at a, at a much shorter range. Um, so, you know, I think, I think it's quite exciting and time will tell whether that works, but there's, there's many other approaches. I think having PRT approved in the United States is definitely a win. And I think it's for a few reasons. So one, the logistics of patients previously traveling to Europe um, was really challenging. I think that it's challenging to be away from your support system. It's financially a burden. It's complicated logistically. So I think that's one thing. Um, I think another challenge was that patients were often getting treated very late in their disease course because providers in the U.S. had no other options and so they were exhausting all treatment options that were available in the U.S. and so many patients were going to Europe quite sick. If we can get patients treated a little bit earlier, I think they'll tolerate the treatment better. I think it may have a better chance of working. They may be able to complete a full course. So I think that there are many reasons that it's just wonderful to have it available in the U.S. now.